People don't want to hear that a person's intelligence is in large measure due to his or her genes. And that there seems to be very little we can do environmentally to increase a person's intelligence, even in childhood. It's not that the environment doesn't matter, but genes appear to be 50 to 80% of the story. People don't want to hear this. In this audio clip, Sam Harris makes two blatantly false claims. First of all, it is simply not known how much genes matter for intelligence. The claim that intelligence is largely genetic is based entirely on two kinds of studies, twin studies and GWA, or genome-wide association studies. Unfortunately, when it comes to determining genetic heritability, these study designs have basically no predictive value. This is known as the missing heritability problem, which can be summed up like this. GWA and twin studies have often found major hereditary differences in traits such as disease risk, intelligence, and even height. But when specific genes are discovered that influence these traits, they don't even come close to accounting for the extent of the heritability. For example, GWA and twin studies claimed that height was up to 90% heritable, and yet only 4% of the heritability of height can be accounted for by the 40 genetic variants identified. That leaves upwards of 80% of the heritability of heights unexplained by genetic differences. In other words, if the difference between the average height of two populations is 25 centimeters, only one of these centimeters can be explained by genetic differences. But how could this be? This is a paradox that can be explained by a fascinating new field known as epigenetics, which entirely dissolves the dichotomy of genes versus environment. We will discuss epigenetics in great depth in future videos, but for now, know that the newly popularized field of science shows very clearly how environmental changes can affect gene expression, and how difficult it is to truly separate environmental from genetic influences on inherited traits. The point is that it is almost never true that genes appear to be 50 to 80% of the story. Not for disease heritability, not for intelligence, and not even for phenotypic heritability like eye or skin color. Take for example the case of Jasmine and Amelia Appleby. These identical twins have different eye and skin colors. Now, a case like this might make you question why they would even be called identical twins if they don't look identical. But unlike fraternal twins, who are created when two separate egg cells are fertilized by two different sperm cells, Amelia and Jasmine were conceived from a single egg cell that was fertilized by a single sperm, which means that they carry an identical set of genes. It just so happens that in this rare case, some of Amelia's genes are expressed differently than Jasmine's. The point is that we should not overestimate the role that our genes play in our appearances. Epigenetics matters. Now the other major claim that Harris is making here, that there seems to be very little we can do to environmentally increase a person's IQ even in childhood, is just shameful. One very obvious example that directly contradicts this is childhood exposure to lead. Exposure to lead does, without a doubt, decrease IQ both in childhood and later in life. Studies suggest that a child will lose nearly two points of IQ for every five micrograms per deciliter of lead in their blood. And as recently as the mid-90s, over half of all African American children had blood lead levels of five micrograms per deciliter, and up to 25% of African American children had greater than 10 micrograms per deciliter of lead in their blood. That's a non-genetic two to four point drop in IQ. The differential exposure of black and white populations to lead could easily cause a measurable difference in average IQ levels between racial groups that are not based on genetic differences. But this is a small decrease compared to the effect that stress and the resulting physical health issues can have on IQ. Black adults are over twice as likely to get diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, or die from cancer when compared with white adults and black children are over three times as likely to live in poverty and have asthma when compared with white children. It has even been reported that simply experiencing racism can increase the chance of getting asthma by up to 60%. Studies have repeatedly shown that this kind of stress induced by poverty, physical health problems, and racism can cause drops of up to 13 points of IQ. Finally, it is very well established that adoption in of itself increases IQ. Any kind of adoption has been associated with an increase of 5 IQ points. 
and in extreme cases where the child started in very bad circumstances, IQ can increase up to 18 points after adoption. Given all of this, it is unsurprising that the difference in average intelligence between whites and blacks is somewhere between 9 and 15 IQ points. This difference is perfectly explained by a 2 to 4 point drop due to lead exposure and a 13 point drop due to high levels of stress. Consider that an adopted black child would very likely have the same IQ as a white child. This is not an issue of genetics, but an issue of environmental impoverishment. Sam Harris has made an extremely basic error of reasoning here called the common cause or lurking variable fallacy, in which he saw two correlated variables, race and IQ, and assumed that one caused the other. Despite Sam's belief, nearly all of the available evidence points towards a third hidden variable, stress, that is causing the correlation between the other two, and who knows how many other lurking variables are affecting these statistics. It seems likely that Sam Harris has never personally experienced the difference in quality of life that is caused by racial inequity. And ironically, the difference in intelligence between blacks and whites is not a problem of genetic racial differences, but a problem of the racism that pointed it out in the first place. Thank you for watching The Paradox Perspective.